to subtle. hit the floor. Everybody do the dinosaur. Corey, recent addition to Team Lotus Box. I believe this is the first event. Both him and Edgar Mogulace, now members of the team. Right, and, you know, we see Johnson over there on Teamer Elementals. That was sort of the the big deck of last weekend in a lot of ways at the standard open in Worcester. So seeing Teamer Elementals versus John Dinosaurs is a great just kind of representation of this week's tech versus last week's tech. Both these players at 3-0, though, you know, this is obviously going to be a great match. Marquise Johnson is a opponent here on Teamer Elementals. Starts off with Stomping Ground and Lanoir Elves. Taylor's oldest time. Yeah. This was the 9-0 deck last week by Paul Muller in the open. It did not convert into the top eight, but it had a lot of results on day two. Oh, so this looks to be a more aggressively slanted version of the deck here with Creeping Trailblazer acting as a sort of elemental lord. Yeah, it certainly is a more aggressive take. We saw some of that in our top eight last week as well. Mostly a red-green deck with just Risen Reef as the blue card. Right, Thunderkin Awakener, Overgrowth Elemental, rounding out this sort of aggro package. From Cory, the Dinosaurs deck, so we're going to have a red-green fight here, is Odapak Huntmaster. The two-drop here. I'm glad you know how to pronounce these. All right, I can, I, I can I, make it up. I don't want to risk it. Rotting, or er, yeah, Rotting Regisaur. The seven-six for Corey. He's gonna have to discard a card on each of his upkeeps. Oh but, no! But it has haste. Thanks for the Huntmaster. So he just crashes in for seven damage. Marky's down to eleven. Is this just gonna be Ball Lightning Summer? Oh, that's good. It is really warm out. If you haven't been. In the Philadelphia area. It is hot it is on the really East Coast this weekend. Yeah. It makes over sense that we're going to get these. Outside. It looks like Marquise might be missing blue mana. I think he is. You're right. Cavalier of Thorns, though, can still spend the mana. Yeah, not missing that blue for long, presumably. And top cards. Temple of Mystery will allow him to get some blue mana. Five, six, reach. Not big enough to block the Rotting Regisaur, though. <laughs> it <laughs> does let him get a card back, though, if he just chump blocks with it. Yeah. Corey just has another Regisaur. Then he'll be off to the races. Let's see Corey just kind of chucking an extra land there. The nice thing about all these dorks is you don't actually need as much mana despite being a big mana creature deck. Odapek Huntmaster, a 1-2 for 2. It makes your dinosaurs cost 1 less. <laughs> it taps to give a dinosaur haste like this Galta. That could have haste. And he only spends 3 mana for it. This is nice. <laughs> Galta with Haste is a good card. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. This is a nice deck. I'm singing here. Um, I think Marquise is, I think he's dead. Uh, yeah. Well, by my math, he is, um, is hold this, on. This I is don't, lethal? I don't have 11 fingers, but I'm going to say, yeah, he's at actual no, zero this is actually This is just lethal. Yep. Oh, cool deck. Okay. Corey Bowmeister with the uh, turn four kill. Uh, I says, yeah, that Marquise's face, that that was my face, yeah, too. Just kind of the... Oh. Ow. Yeah, uh, okay. Good game, I guess. Huh. Just watching John Dinosaurs. So, I guess, Emma, we're going to need to just... Don't blink here, or you'll miss this. Yeah, and, you know, we didn't even see Corey start attacking until turn three. And then Marquise was dead on four. With three total creatures attacked. Well, sort of. Two different creatures attacked, but one attacked twice. Yeah. Corey, the I, first game win there. I just... Is there a feeling as good in a team tournament as just 
three minutes into the round, you lean over to your teammates and you go, hey, guys, I'm up a game. Yeah, that's nice. Or when, when your teammates, I've been in the spot where both your teammates do two teammates do that early, and I was like, ah, all right, I'm taking, I can take this round off. Oh, you know what? That's nice. We'll, we'll take the scenic route. <laughs> I might even might even let my opponent have a game. Who knows? Four color Delver Mirror on the legacy table. We have Dredge versus Azorius on modern. Let's look over the sideboards. So this is the kind of matchup that I think would be hard to sideboard on the team or elemental side because you're a beatdown deck, but you're not as big as your opponent's beatdown deck. Right. So there's a certain point where you're generally trying to capitalize on your creatures being a little bit bigger than what your opponent is doing. And unfortunately, sometimes your opponent's creatures are a lot bit bigger than what you're doing. Yeah, we saw there with Thunderkin Awakener facing off against Rotting Regisaur. Corey's three drop was bigger than Marquise's five drop. Well, if you think about it, uh, Cavalier of Thorns has right. five power. Right. So if you double that, you get ten. And then that's almost as big as Galta. Almost. Right, okay. So we... This is a good formula we're setting up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The ratio seems to be in Corey's advantage. <laughs> it, they're, they're good numbers if you're on the dino side. Out of sideboards, Corey. Veil of Summer, Thrashing Bronsidon, Flame Sweep, Theater of Horrors, Cast Down, and Noxious Grasp. I don't think he actually needs to get very fancy here. No, you might be end up looking into Noxious Grasp just to make sure you can also check things like Nissa. Cast Down is going to be good against these kind of chunky creature decks. Right. But we saw that last game. Corey doesn't really need to change up what he's doing very much. His creatures are just bigger and can win on the back of that. If you want to see all the matches from last week's first standard open that we had with Magic 2020. You can find them on our YouTube page, Star City Games. We have the Best of the SCG Tour, also our Versus Live, which Corey features on, and Commander Versus at youtube.com slash starcitygames. Corey is a riot. He's brand new on there, and he fits right in. I really like watching him on there. Maybe next week we're going to get some John Dinos. Would Maybe. not be surprised. Yeah, I mean, it'll be great. They can have the new open winner on, on the Versus Live. Or is what? that a spoiler? What made this... Could be. <laughs> <laughs> what made this deck good all of a sudden, do you think? Rotting Regisaur as well as Marauding Raptor. So there are things that actually gave the deck something that's good at applying pressure in the early turns of the game, which is what the Dinosaur deck was lacking before. You had things like Ripjaw, Raptor, Regisaur Alpha that were good once you got to the fourth and fifth turns. But even if you crank those out, playing a Ripjaw Raptor on turn three isn't that impressive. It's not killing anyone that quickly. So having things that can actually just start attacking as fast as we saw Corey's creatures start attacking that game is the difference between it being a tier one deck and a meme FNM deck. Already red green strategies are looking to be pretty good in the meta game as well. Just strategies based on size. Right, exactly. You know, at this point, it feels like it's just so much stronger to be proactive rather than reactive that you might as well just do it, kill people, and then be the deck that is the best at killing people. Okay, for a second game. The Dinosaur Matters cards from Corey's side. Odapec Huntmaster, a four of. Only one copy of Drover of the Mighty, but he does have two Savage Stomps and three Regisaur Alphas. Both players on seven. Second game. Marquise, the deck that relies more on its third color of the two, though a lot of the blue cards in his deck aren't particularly good in this matchup. See so commune with dinosaurs from Corey. Top five. You can find a land or a dinosaur. You thought ancient stirrings was ancient. This is like prehistoric stirrings. <laughs> And just a land, Woodland Cemetery. <laughs> I 
And for Marquise Leafkin Druid, so some mana ramp of his own. Corey, Odapec Huntmaster, that is also a ramp spell in his deck, makes dinosaur spells cost one less. That's what we call the developmental phase of the game. Yeah. Both players want to skip straight to the four drops. Corey would really like to dodge Omnath here. That would be so brutal, be just because it would basically put Marquise ahead two turns. Yeah. Risen Reef was the play, so Marquise will draw a card, but still developing right now. Not an Omnath. We see a cast down hiding out in Baumeister's hand, and what he's doing here is likely weighing if he wants to develop his own battlefield or try to set Marquis back instead. The drawback of these big, chunky creature decks is that it's hard for you to double spell, so you generally have to choose between developing your own battlefield or interacting with your opponents. So if you had cast down plus a two, plus a two drop, that would make be a good play, something we could play it and something else. For example... Okay. The Marauding Raptor. And he's actually going to just play Ripjaw Raptor as a second spell. Whew. Cantrip. That's what we call synergy. Yeah, Marauding Raptor also makes creature spells cost one less, so it is another mana creature in the deck. And love this. Yeah, Marauding Raptor. When another creature enters the battlefield under your control, Marauding Raptor deals two damage to it. And gets plus two plus so in the case of Ripjaw Raptor, that's not a bad thing at all, as Corey will draw a card. As a matter of fact, I would love to draw a card. Thank yeah. you for asking. Both players kind of have their card advantage engine set up for Marquise. That means elementals as Leafkin Druid triggers off Risen Reef, puts a land into the play. From M20, Marauding Raptor, it enrages the other dinosaurs. Specifically good with Ripjaw Raptor in the deck. And something about Raptor that's interesting is it doesn't only trigger whenever a dinosaur enters the battlefield under your control. Right, so there is a cost here. Quote, unquote. Yeah, there are, if you have a creature with less than three toughness, the Raptor will just eat it. Eat it, yeah. Maraud it, if you will. But the raptor likes to just feast on dinosaurs. It takes a big chunk out of them and then grows stronger. Delicious. It's kind of a weird flavor, right? It only it eats everything, but it only gets stronger when it eats other dinosaurs. I mean, it makes sense. Uh... Kind of. <laughs> Lava coil, of course. Uh, Ripjaw raptor? Uh, no. No, I'll take the hunt master. Wow. Outside assistance. Yeah. <laughs> exiled away. And that Lava Coil not being able to take out Ripjaw Raptor is exactly part of what this dinosaur deck tries to capitalize on, is it knows it's able to just trump a bunch of this conditional removal on the basis of just having the biggest creatures. It's really true if you look at last week's first week of Standard. Everyone was playing red removal spells and no one was playing black removal spells. We're seeing a lot of shocks, lightning strikes, and flame slap, and Lava Coils. If that's the case, cards like Rotting Regisaur and Ripjaw Raptor look to be really good this week. Exactly. Let's see if Baumeister can continue to just go off. And here's Rotting Regisaur. And Galta. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. This is 19 power of creatures. Oh, yeah. It's, it is the fourth turn. Corey has 35-ish power in play. No big deal. This matchup is unbelievably good for Corey. I love his deck in the meta. If, if this is what he's going to be playing against, his deck, this is fantastic. Yeah, you, we just see Marquis like, going, yeah, yeah, like, guess I'm going to chump blah. Like, what's he going to do, burn spell these? I could <laughs> Come on, act of treason. I mean, that would be really good. <laughs> but I think that kind of speaks to how powerful Corey's cards are. If your best solution is, They're I so hope big. I can steal theirs. Just the whole table, just, you can just hear him coming. It's too big. Galta, who shakes the table. What are you doing? (laughs) 
card here we take a look at on Marquise's side. Thunderkin we Awakener. Got a reader. We saw this one in Modern. Uh, you can also play it in Standard. It attacks and brings back Risen Reef. Marquise is drawing a lot of extra cards, which is really neat. Yeah, you know, these are. Uh, this is a format where having a bunch of extra lands is not as good as it is in Legacy. And Corey blocks. Uh, Marquise extends the hand. That is a beating. That is a, a trampling, if you would. You know, so the thing is, is it looks like people got so caught up asking if they could, and they never asked if they should. Yeah, and you see that on his face, saying, "Yeah, that was that that happened." So Marquis is going to have to rely on his teammates, Paul Lynch and Joel Sadowski. Now, both of them have won their first game. Yeah, it, you know, it's in a pretty good spot for them. But this is the kind of matchup for Joel where we see that Dredge is going to be favored over Azorius pre-board, which is just what these graveyard decks do. Before your opponent has their rest in pieces, their surgicals, etc., you tend to just put a bunch of prized amalgams into play and right. go, all right, can we move on now, please? Right, so Joel did win the game one, and exactly. that's where we're going to go to over to the modern table, but the post-board games are more difficult. If you look at Shaheen's sideboard, he has three copies of Rest in Peace. Right. Along with an extra sweeper, he puts a copy of Wrath of God in the deck, something that can be pretty good against Dredge. And things, I think, will get tougher. On Joel's side, some thought seizes. Yeah, the big thing that we're going to see coming in out of Joel's sideboard is Nature's Claim, just because that's one of the easiest ways to answer cards like Rest in Peace. You don't really want to risk overboarding when you're playing a synergy deck like Dredge, but having access to things like Nature's Claim, very good. Assassin's Trophy is a good catch-all against some of the cards that you might end up playing against in case you say expect Rest in Peace and then Serrani plays a Graft Digger's Cage, for example. Thought sees from Joel here on game number two. See some cyber cards. It is a rest in peace in Shaheen's hand. So Joel has caught it before it hit the table. Yeah, rest in peace, Mana Leak, Timely Reinforcements, Opt and Jace. A great hand here from Shaheen, but you see Joel just immediately has to name rest in peace. Oh yeah, absolutely. You just you gotta get that rest in peace out of there. Looks like Timely Reinforcements has come in out of the sideboard. Yeah, and it's something that Shaheen just wants to buy time because something like Dredge a lot of times is going to operate like a combo deck, but what it actually is is an aggro deck that abuses the graveyard. So all it's doing is trying to put a bunch of 3-3s three and 1-1s one -ones and so on into play and then cast some free lightning helixes. So if you start thinking of it as an aggro deck instead of as a combo deck that's going to do something infinitely or what have you, it's much easier to understand why we see Serrani bringing in something like Timely that's just going to end up buying him extra turns. And step opt from Shaheen. Likes the card he sees. Another cyborg card in hand is Celestial Purge. So his last two draws are Celestial Purge and an island. Shows the island. Back to Joel we go. Faith is looting. Shaheen can mana leak this. Both players know it, and he will. Oh, yeah. you want it. One, you just want to get the mana leak when you know that the dredge deck doesn't have to cast spells once it puts dredgers in the graveyard. You want to find a way to spend it. Yeah. And then also... You know, Joel knows it's there. It's not a secret. We know why Serrani played this island. Conflagrate for zero for Joel. Just wants to get it into the graveyard. If you don't mana leak the Faith Looting, you end up mana leaking the Conflagrate for zero. And <laughs> who wants to do that? I would. Uh, I don't. I don't want Joel to have spells. Why would he cast a Conflagrate for zero if he didn't want it to resolve? Howled Fountain for Shaheen. If they were targeting your Phantasmal image, then you'd have to leave. See? Wow. There's so many things that don't work about that. Oh, yeah. Multiple. Cathartic Reunion from Joel. Sheen would love another Mana Leak here, but I don't think Oof. he has it. Discards Life from the Loam and Prized Amalgam. This is kind of the power turn from yeah. Sadowski, as long as it's Life from the Loam can hit something else. 
And loam is the first dredge. Oof. Here's another loam and a another loam. So <laughs> creeping shield. So dredgers are set up. Drains for three. Second loam. Dredge is three more. Blood ghast. Land. Faithless looting. Blood ghast means he's going to get to... Everything's going to work here. Prized amalgam is the third dredge. So children drains Shaheen down to 17. Two amalgams in the graveyard, a blood gas in the graveyard, and he has not made a land drop yet. Does he have one? He does. Ooh, that, big turn. This was a big, yeah, exactly. This is a big turn from Joel, just being able to put all of this stuff onto the battlefield. That's two amalgams and a blood gas. Right. That's a two-turn clock for Sarani. Now, I believe Shaheen, yeah, he's going to Celestial Purge away the blood gas. I think he has a detention sphere for the amalgams. So things are okay for now. He's taking care of the whole board. The awkward thing is if Joel can just find a nature's claim, which he's already going to have because he wants to answer rest in peace, Detention then it's fine. Sphere is weak to that. And ultimately, Shaheen just bought himself a turn. Yeah. Right. right. Now Joel, he Sarani's tapped out. Joel has a grip of cards. Yep. And right now he's debating whether he wants to cast life from the loams or whether he just wants to flash back that faithless looting. And generally speaking, you're just going to want to cast the loam if you can because that's going to put you closer to a big conflict, right? Yeah, it doesn't have any dredgers in the graveyard yet either. Exactly, and this just lets you put a dredger in the graveyard and the number of lootings you can flash back is fairly finite in the grand scheme of things. So we see life from the loam. That one gets two lands back, can make a land drop for the turn. He has a choice between playing a tapped shock land or a fetch land here, and I really like him choosing to play this bloodstained mire instead. That's what he'll do. He'll go for the fetch land. Now he chooses to not play the a second loam. So the big thing here is he specifically just wants to hold up this bloodstained mire to represent something else and not expose too many cards in graveyard to something like another copy of Rest in Peace or what have you. Okay. He also doesn't necessarily want to pay too much life over the course of the game. And finally, this Bloodstained Mire is something he can put into the graveyard in order to fuel future life from the loans. He's taking a little bit more of a conservative line here. Here is Narset from Shaheen. That's a pretty reasonable card. It's You can't draw more than one card ability. Not doesn't come into play very much against Dredge. So it's an interesting ruling actually, where if you have already drawn a natural card for a turn, you cannot dredge after that because dredge is replacing a draw, but you can't do the draw. But if the first card was a dredge, then you can. You can keep dredging. Exactly. You can keep dredging because you have not yet drawn a card for a turn, so Narset doesn't try to stop you, so to speak. Narset finds Jace the Mind Sculptor. She has plenty of strength at four mana if he can get there. So because there's a life from the loam in Joel's graveyard, he should be okay for this coming turn. Right. Heads up play from Joel here, choosing to fetch and shock this blood crypt just to make it so she can't gain life from timely reinforcements. That's really good play from Joel. Joel. Because he's seen the timely in his hand, but still very well played. Right, and he, you know, Joel's just had some very impressive play here on our tour as well as the Magic Fest circuit. And we see Conflagrate for three to take care of Narset. Another land from Joel shocks down to 11. Three mana flashes back Faithless Looting. We should have some dredgers in here. First it's Stinkweed Imp, dredging five. Nothing of note to flip over there. Looks like a Narc Amoeba. Looks like he also hit a copy of Hogak Arisen Necropolis. Okay, yeah, and things got good here. Another ch creeping chill. And a blood ghast. And he's already played his land for the turn, so the blood ghast is going to stay in the graveyard. Narc Amoeba into play. Looting is always so funny because you put two cards in your hand and they usually just immediately go right back <laughs> to the graveyard. <laughs> and like, All right, yeah, I'll put these tank for 10 seconds. All right, yeah, I don't, I don't know who I'm kidding. Yeah, these are these are still in the graveyard. That was three man on Milton. And Hogak Arisen Necropolis. Looks like he's just going to get to cast that one. He certainly has enough cards in his graveyard to delve it into play. Right, he still needs a couple of creatures for the Convoke. 
but he already has a blood gas lined up. So if he can just find something else next turn, then there's going to be a 7-7 seven, seven facing down, right. or 8-8 eight, eight, rather, facing down Serrani. So all right. he needs to do, mill over one more blood gas. He has one in his graveyard for now. So that's the first he, Golgari mana. Right. And then if he can just find that second blood gas off the top of his library. Some timely reinforcements for Shaheen now that Joel has a creature in pl on the battlefield. Shaheen wants to go ahead and make three one ones, which, uh, oh yeah, they're Shaheen tokens. Right. And because of that copy of Creeping Chill, it actually puts Sarani at a lower life total. Right. Goes back up to, looks like 16. A Dredge of Stinkweed Imp. That's a second Ooh, blood, blood gas. gas. There we go. Number two. So a land and two blood gas should pave the way here for Hogak. And Joel wisely kept those copies of Life and Loam in his hand from earlier in the game and didn't just blow them when he didn't have lands in Graveyard to grab them. So now he's able to just put extra cards in his hand and or put more lands, more right. importantly, in order to recur these blood ghasts whenever he wants. So one life from the loam. We'll grab back yeah, three lands out of here. That should not be a problem. One of them, importantly, being Blast Zone. And looks like Forgotten Cave as well, so Cycling yes. Land. Forgotten Cave is incredible out of the dredge decks because it protects your dredge enablers from surgical extraction. Right. Yeah, you can cycle. You may cycle in response. It also is a way to just, you know, keep turning every... You can buy back the loam for one red mana and then spend two to get back the Forgotten Cave and so on. So you can just spend three mana to mill three as many times as you want. There is Blast Zone. Brings back Bloodgast. And there is the Arisen Necropolis. Convokes for two. Going to have to delve away five. Easy enough. You know, I've been trying to write a joke that turned Hodor into Hogak all week, and I just can't right. do it. Right, do you what? have one? It's not going to be a good one. Uh, look, I just need help. I've been, I've been trying. I've, I'm, I'm, I'm putting myself out there on the air, Matthias. Save me. <laughs> Hogak's gonna, gonna show him the door. Ooh. There we go. Nailed it. Slam it shut. Sheen does find land number four. So Sarani does have a copy of Jace the Mind Sculptor in his hand. Right. And this is going to be able to just return the copy of Hogak to Joel's hands. That's actually a place that's not very easy for Joel to get it back on the battlefield from. Right. It's a situation where you can only exile that many cards from your graveyard so many times. Now, why do you think Narc Amoeba did not attack there? Might have been a missed opportunity. I know he was playing around timely reinforcements earlier. Right. And here's a play you mentioned. Jace unsummoning the Hogak. Joel going to cycle to get some dredging even more quickly. Cycles to indistinct weed imp. Dredge is five. Here's another creeping chill. Shaheen down to 13. If he can find one more creeping chill, the last one, then Shaheen will be down to 10 and blood guests will have haste. Another counter on Blast Zone as it ticks up. For the turn, the dredge will be Stinkweed Imp. Joel has one more copy of Conflagrate in the deck. Has not put it into the graveyard yet. Conflagrate would be such a big hit here. And there it is. Speak of the devil. Yeah, that might be able to clean things up. Ooh. The question is, is it, le is it lethal? At 13, it's hard to imagine so. He has, yeah, we'll see. He has 
Gets back three lands with the first loam. I know he has a confl uh, another blood gas in the graveyard. So if he can conflagrate for nine, I think that would work. He'd remove the blockers, shoot for four, swing. F also, would have the to blockers, play a land there, yeah. though? Yeah, so you'd have to get up to ten cards in hand. Remove the blockers, shoot for five, or for six. So you need to be a nine-point conflagrate, shoot for six. Then a swing for seven. Some assembly required. Yeah, he's definitely doing the math here. Yeah, I believe, yeah, he needs a ten to get up to a 10-card hand for this to work. Conflagrate, flashback. Discard six. One, two, three, three upstairs. All right, down to 10. Shaheen down to 10. A land means that Bloodgast has haste. And a swing in. It might just take down Jace since he can't go for lethal this turn. Right. This is the spot where he can charge Blast Zone up to three in order to be have lethal through a Wrath next turn. So I'm, I'd be shocked if he didn't just put Sarani to five and say this is good enough. That was the play. Back starting to go. Even a Supreme Verdict is unlikely to get Shaheen out of this. No, no. Since we can put Blast Zone up to three on Sadowski's side. You can then, at the end of Sarani's following turn, blow up Detention Sphere with Blast Zone. And any land is right. also going to be lethal with these Blood Gas. This is, this is locked up without some seriously fancy stuff from Sarani. Well, an Ott puts a card to the bottom. He does have his second copy of Timely Reinforcements in his hand. That's a big game. That might get him another turn. Shaheen says, go? Probably can't. Yeah, we have Snapcaster Mage, Opt, Jace, Timely Reinforcements. You're discussing here with teammate Corey Bowmeister. Yeah, I'm not usually one to offer help, but I'd recommend casting Timely Reinforcements here. Asking if there's any other play. He'll do that. Goes up to 11, makes three blockers. Blast Zone to three. And you mentioned about that detention sphere still hiding out on the bottom of the screen. Right. It is ready to go for next turn. Back to Joel. It should see how much he can, continues to dredge. He's through both his conflagrates. So there isn't too much else left. He'll dredge life from the loam. And finds a Ooh. creeping chill. So that was the fourth and final copy of chill. Shaheen is down to eight. One, two, three, and believe four. Little did Shaheen know that starting match life totals for this were actually eight and 32. That's a nice card. Three blocks, Shaheen to seven. All the blood gas in the graveyard. Shaheen, well, down to seven means that, yeah, that detention sphere on end step does plus the Narc Amoeba. Right, that'll be enough. Yeah, I was going to say a rest in peace would be enough for Shaheen here, but I don't think it is. No, because even now we see Joel able to just get three lands with this life from the loom in order to recur these blood ghasts again. Right. And this is the power of this, of this deck where it is ultimately just a very resilient aggro strategy. Yeah, land brings back three blood ghasts. Post-combat. So they're ready for next turn. And I like this. Actually, Joel splitting the difference. He wants to bring back two blood gas. Oh, this is so nice. He's trying to play around both Detention Sphere and Rest in Peace at the same time. Right. So this is a spot where the biggest thing that you want to make sure that you don't get caught by is just something that exiles all of your creatures, for example. Right. Deputy Maybe a Terminus. Yeah, Terminus would be good. It is a May, so he puts two of them on the battlefield. Sheen's had Snapcaster Mage on timely reinforcements. Again, they decide this is the only way for him to stay alive. Well, time right. is 
all the these decks tend to need a lot, a good chunk of games. Yeah, he goes up to 13. Do you think Joel blows up the detention sphere then? This is a spot where it's hard to imagine he doesn't just because it is more attackers. Yeah, it looks like he's leaning the same way. Checking in with teammates. They decide, yes, it's time. He can always get the blast zone back with life from the wall. Right. And Actually, to clear... He can clear away blockers. Well, it starts with one charge counter. Something so. I wish that Joel had done that previous turn with Bloodgast is cast Hogak. Okay. Because Hogak has Trample. Right. Then this and, board wouldn't uh, be enough. Exactly. This this would be such a different turn if there were an 8-8 Trample creature on the battlefield. And if those Bloodgasts were to get Terminus or something to that effect, it's so hard to cast Hogak anyway that it's hard to say if it's necessarily worth a resource in the first place. Sure. When you see the stacking of the five creatures going, all right, what does this attack look like? Yeah. What is uh, it? You know what, Alpha, actually. It's the, uh, the attack all button. Yeah. <laughs> right click, please. We'll just save some time. That's what we do here. We just mash the attack all button. <laughs> and attack in is for 11. Shaheen is at 13, but there will be some blocks. Again, these aren't trades so much as they are just chump blocks. He'll, Sheen's going to block everything. And there's a spot with these blue-white control decks where rather than trying to necessarily win via traditional means, you sort of create a scub game in which your goal is actually to just beat every single card that the dredge deck has. You know, we see right. Sarani reaching towards that library right now to go, all right, how many times can you actually do this? Right. Yeah, blue-white oftentimes try mills your opponent out through exhaustion. Right. There are no more conflagrates. There are no more copies of Creeping Chill. The creatures are all that Joel has left. So on Joel's side, we see after this an attack, he brings back all his blood ghasts. He casts Golgari Thug and then convokes out Hogak. Says, show me a supreme verdict. Ooh, it looks like he has another timely reinforcements hiding out. Or a Celestial Purge. I think That's Celestial Purge. I, I believe he's out of timely reinforcements. Says the one in his graveyard. Look, where there's a graveyard, there's a way. It's true. Yeah, land plus Snapcaster will do it. And his hand was Celestial Purge, Jace, and a land. There are no outs there. Top card said, hey, that was Cryptic. Would have that done it? Eh, one, two. I love this. The draw, draw additional cards. Oh, no, Cryptic into Verdict Cryptic. Oh, It's wow. the still had all, like, one card away. We had you. Uh, of course, if I had only gotten to draw all these cards for free. These are some nice uh, top of the cards are Cryptic, Cryptic, Verdict, Cryptic, s Surgical Extraction. Ooh. I think that could have done it. Yeah, that actually, you what, exile all the blood ghasts and, yeah. and then all and then of a sudden... Cryptic their team while you then sweep their team, put it in the graveyard, Surgical it. I mean, if blood ghasts are gone, I actually just think Joel lost that game. Well, because then there's an extra turn where they can't attack so she can make a Jace. Right, and, well, yeah. and the thing is, is... Joel can't get back his Amalgams anymore, assuming his Narcomoebus are gone, because he has a lower number in this version of the deck. There are no Conflagrates, there are no Creeping Chills, and he doesn't have enough creature or cards left to just start dredging back creatures the normal way. A close one. Then Shaheen would have needed Game 3 on top of it. Right. So, well, there is a Game 3 we will get to see, and that's the Delver Mirror between Pete Ingram and Paul Lynch. Paul Lynch, a former Top 4 competitor here on the SEG Tour in our Team Constructed events. Right, and this is actually the Is It Delver on the left side from the looks of Right, things. there's no copies of Renin 6. So we see these basic islands, which are actually one of the better cards against Renin 6 right now because it hurts the loop your wastelands plan. All right, and we see wastelands going to work here on Lynch's side. Takes care of a tropical island. So that mana fight that you frequently see at the beginning of Delver Mirrors already underway. No basics in Pete's deck. It's hard to afford it when you're playing the four full, co full four colors. And he will manage to get a Tarmogoyf down. Card we don't see as much of in Legacy now, though it is still very good against Is It decks. That is, if it gets to make it onto the battlefield, which this one does not. Good old days. But they were they were tapped out. How dare they? 
Some additions to Izzet Delver. Four Dreadhorde Arcanist, now a staple in the deck. Right, the card is just so strong with Chain Lightning in general, and in a lot of ways it kind of does an Insect Elaboration impression, but also it has this grindy aspect to it that we see from cards like Renin Six. It's just so strong when there are so many efficient, powerful spells in a format like Legacy. And here is the Dreadhorde Arcanist. You see the graveyard, it's tons of options. Brainstorms and Ponder. And the Arcanist, the kind of card you don't really let them untap with. So here's Lightning Bolt. Looks like a pass. On Pete's side, he doesn't have much to stabilize with. It looks like his hand is a Daze and a Leovold. Yeah, both players are just kind of looking for some sort of thing to put the game completely away. Well, here's the try from Paul. It's true name Nemesis. Pete can't let that one resolve. Right, and it looks like he has a couple of different answers, and he's trying to choose which one he wants to use. Yeah, rather than pay for the days, he floats a mana and ca and casts the days with the alternate cost. Doesn't want his days to get dazed there. Right, you know, we saw Lynch earlier kind of playing around days a little bit, which right. means that Lynch thinks it's a thing to be respected, and Ingram doesn't want to get got by it as a result. Pete uses the floating mana to cast Brainstorm. Brainstorm finds two copies of Delver. And then third land from Pete. It's Delver of Secrets and another Delver. Those are both the cards he found off his Brainstorm, and he passes. Back on Paul's side, he's going to have to race these. Has another True Name Nemesis. True Name Nemesis is pretty good at racing. Yeah. If you can't answer, might as well shove, and that's what Paul does. Passes back. I will name you. Preordain, the top card. Transforms both Delvers in Insectile Aberration, and the race is on. Pete at 15, Paul at 18. Paul ahead right now. Neither player any good at blocking. <laughs> and Paul to 12. Pete's follow-up is Leovold. You know, we talked about True Name Nemesis being good at racing. It is not necessarily good at racing from behind. Right. It lets you control the race, but... Pete just has too many more creatures right now. Right. This is a spot where Pete's going to have this locked up in two turns, and it takes Paul five to kill Ingram. Days a pickup. That's not going to do anything for Paul Lynch. Looks like two lands and a daze. Yeah, I think he's just trying to figure out at this point what his outs are. Yeah, if you should even attack, because the clock is actually the same both ways. Right. It's a two-turn clock he's up against. He says go. So the thing is, is you get more draw steps if you can block the Leovold. If you take the full nine here, all of a sudden you need to find a way to kill both insect elaborations in one turn. And with Pete drawing Lightning Bolt this turn, he actually was dead if he attacked. Exactly. Ingram casts the Preordain. Finds another Preordain. Easy enough. The old ponder for yeah, ponder. Love it. Wishing for more wishes. Or wishing for the same number of wishes. Oh, yeah. It's like the genie strategy, but the less broken version. <laughs> I will wish for exactly one wish. Okay. Renin 6 is a uh, saucy pickup here. A good card. I'm not sure he needs it at, at this point, but it's not a bad one. Paul goes down to 6. Ingram says go. A lightning bolt's a pickup for Lynch. He can bolt down a flyer, but he is dead to that lightning bolt in Ingram's hand. Right. Even even if he found something like a brainstorm, Leovold is shutting it off here. So bolts the doubt the insectile aberration. Leovold draws Ingram a card. The card is a Tarmogoyf. Just not likely to come up. Ingram draws for the turn. Draws running six, swing for three, lynch to three, 
and Lightning Bolt will do the trick. A win in Legacy for Ingram, a Stampede of Dinosaurs in Standard for Corey Baumeister, and their team moves to 4 and 0. Oh. Yeah, and you can just just hear it going. Yeah. <laughs> just hear it go. The Stampede. And that's how a lot of those Delver decks, the matchups in general tend to go. So you see the smaller things like Delver trade a good bet and then someone tries to stick a more medium threat in the